Hallelujah. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6. This story in Luke 6 is in all three of the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I chose to read and use Luke 6. And I'll tell you why. Because Luke 6 adds a... One little caveat to the story that I think is important. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. Now, Luke says it's his right hand. Matthew and Mark. Matthew and Mark to say it's his hand. That's why I chose that. Uh, Luke, because I'm going to focus on the right hand. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an occasion against him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then Jesus said unto them, I will ask you one thing, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it. And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. A man with a withered hand. He's an unnamed man. At times in the, in the Gospels and in Jesus' discourse with people, we know their names. They're, they're, they're mentioned. Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. A wee, wee little man was he. Uh, Jarius. Other people, their name. Lazarus. Their name. Sometimes they, we even know what their occupation was. The rich young ruler. Or we know what their place is in life. You see, there were two classes of people in biblical days. There were the haves, and they were there were the really have-nots. You were either wealthy or you were very very poor you were a peasant there wasn't much of a middle class we know very little about this man we do we do not know his name he was just a god he was just a man who had a withered right hand now we don't know how it became withered we don't know if it was withered at birth Remember the blind man in is it John chapter 9? The disciples said, Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Net neither. But this has happened that the, the works of God might be manifest. So it doesn't even tell us that this man had a withered hand from birth. We don't know if it was due to an injury. We don't know what his occupation was. Maybe he was a farmer. Maybe he heard it on the farm. Maybe he was a carpenter like our Lord. Maybe he heard it in carpentry. Maybe he had been a soldier and, it, and, and he became crippled in battle. Maybe he was assaulted. Maybe somebody beat him up. Maybe somebody beat him when he was a kid. Maybe somebody beat him when he was an adult. We don't know. We just know he had a withered right hand. And because of that, it had a profound effect upon his life. You see, in Scripture, when we read about the right hand, we, we consider that, uh, you, how many are left-handed here today? Because I'm going to offend you. Bless your hearts. We have one South Paul in the room. When my mother was a kid, she was naturally left-handed, and her aunts forced her to be right-handed. It was looked, I guess it was looked down upon. I don't know. I, had I been around, I would have said to them at the time, hey, it's hard enough to get good left-hand pitching in the major leagues as it is. Don't, tur don't turn her into a right-hander, you know. But because of that, what is, what's the term they call it? Dexteritis? She could write with both hands at the same time. I can't even write with my right hand. I mean, my handwriting is very important. But in the scripture, the right hand is the hand of authority. Jesus is set down at the right hand of God. 
The right hand. Remember in Revelation that he that walketh amongst the midst of the seven golden candlesticks holds in his right hand the seven stars. He holds in his hand the seven messengers of the churches, of the seven churches. That's the hand of authority. It's the hand of usefulness. This man, because he had a withered hand, it kept him from being fully productive. I won't say it kept him from being productive at all, but he was at a great disadvantage, as, as one can well imagine. He wasn't fully productive. It kept him from being fully useful. And you know, in that society, it made him an outcast. We know this. He was in the synagogue. Jesus, as was his custom, when he was amongst the villages and towns in Palestine, he would visit the synagogues on the Sabbath day, and he would preach and teach. And so did the apostles. Paul was his custom to go into the synagogues and to teach and to preach and to reason with the Jews. Remember the man at the gate, beautiful. What was he doing there? Remember he was lame? He was begging. Why was he begging? He couldn't, he couldn't work. And there, there was no social welfare other than to beg. He was an outcast. Blind Bartimaeus, an outcast. He looked down upon him. When, when blind Bartimaeus started to cry out, what did they say? Keep your mouth shut. You're a nuisance. You're blind. Stop that. So here was this guy. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it seems that they were kind of putting him forth there a little bit because they wanted to see what if Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. This, this man represents, now I'm not taking away from the miracle of the healing of this man. I believe in divine healing. But I want to draw a spiritual analogy for a few moments today. He represents all those that are withered in their spirit and withered in their soul that feel that they have no effective or useful place in God's kingdom. They feel that they're not useful in their ministry. They're not useful in the, in the work of the church. They're not useful in their own vocation. Have you ever run up against a wall, even in your own vocation? What about relationships? You have withered relationships? There are a whole host of withered relationships. Withered relationships between husband and wife, between father and son, and, and mother and daughter, and, and brother and sister. This is what this man represents. Those that have been withered. Those that have dried up. Maybe dried up spiritually. Do you feel parched? How did he get this way? Turn to, turn to Psalms chapter 3. I want to read a verse to you about Jesus. Some people are withered up and they've been hurt in the church of God. I had a lady say to me one time years ago, she had been a evangelist in the, she was, not that it mattered, but she was a black lady. Protest me at the end of the service if you want to be saying that. But she was a black lady, she was an evangelist in the uh, Afro-Methodist Episcopal Church, which is traditionally a black denomination, and the Church of God in Christ, which is a black denomination. The Church of God in Christ used to call that the Black Assemblies of God. Black Pentecostal group. But she told me one time, she said, Brother Dietrich, there is no hurting like the hurting of the saints of God in labor. You know why that is? Because we have higher expectations from the church than we do the world. Now I know some people will say that the world treats them better than the church. I've not found it because I think they're I think there's some scoundrels in the world. I think there are some people that they are they act just like their father the devil. They lie, 
they cheat, they steal, and they will betray you. But why, why is it when it happens in the church we're not expecting it to happen? Why when it happens, when, when insults and injury come from those we love the most, maybe it's something that was spoken over us by a parent, or a loved one, or a friend. Anyone ever say to you, you'll never amount to anything in your life? When I was a kid in high school, uh, my daddy died when I was 13, so I went to work as soon as I could, trying to help out my mother. And I remember the first time I bought my own school clothes, she felt so bad. I said, don't worry about it. I bought, I bought better things than she would have been in. I thought she was done. I didn't want to look like an old man before my time. Please. I'm doing myself the favor here. <laughs> but I went to work and I worked at the school. There was a program there for low-income kids. I'm not ashamed to say we were low-income. We were low-income before low-income was cool. I used to say that when we were first married, we first had kids, there were times that we were so poor we were only po because we couldn't afford the other OR at the end of it. You know? I used, to, I used to come home from work when, I, when we first moved back to Elizabethville almost 20 years ago, and I got paid on a weekly basis. I was a temp, and the reason I wouldn't let them hire me at the job where I was is because they withheld the pay on you, and they only paid twice a month, whether there was five weeks in the month. I mean, you, we got paid twice a month, so it's possible we would go three weeks without pay, and I could not do that. Until, until finally the manager said to me one day, maybe we can work something out. But I used to come home and I used to give Kitty 20 bucks. Can you imagine that? 20 bucks. Can you feed a family of five on 20 bucks? Now, we, that wasn't mean we didn't have, doesn't mean we didn't have anything in the house, but we needed to put some stuff in there to go with it. And she said, well, let's see what we can do. And uh, we ate more chicken. And you can shake a stick at it. A chicken that has the backbone. 19 cents a pound it was at Wise's then. I used to say, my old lady can frickin' see a chicken in more ways than you can shake a stick. Let me tell you. But we ate, hey, does it look like I suffered? I, I, I did not suffer. But when I was a kid, I went to work at school. And sometimes it was janitor's work, sometimes I worked for the band director. And I had a lot of, a lot of fun stories I can tell you, but one of the jobs was, I, when I was a sophomore in high school, I still played basketball, but by my junior year, I went to work and I quit playing basketball. And uh, one of the jobs I got was at the home games. I would sweep the floor. I, it did not humiliate me that I was now sweeping the floors for the guys that I used to play. It didn't bother me. But some guy whose family owned a business in the neighboring county said to me one day, and I never took it to heart because I had my own opinion of him, but he said to me, you'll never amount to more than anything than a janitor. As if being a janitor was a terrible thing. To all the janitors out there, hey, hey. But listen to what they said about Jesus. Lord, Jesus said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many, there, many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in Words can keep you from being what God wants you to be in the kingdom of God. You ever been called stupid? You ever felt like you were stupid? Did you ever, were you ever told that you just didn't have the gifts or talents necessary to be able to be effective, whether it's in your job or whether it's in ministry? You know, God doesn't anoint talent. God anoints people. And those people that are anointed will far exceed in the gifts that God uses them in than they ever would in their own natural talents. God calls the unqualified, underqualified, inexperienced people to do exploits in Him if they can tap into the restorative power of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's neglect. Some people have been abused. I, 
when I was a kid, one of my jobs was to, uh, well, I had a couple of jobs. I, let me tell you about my abused childhood. I, one of my jobs was to uh, dry dishes. I hate drying dishes. Now, I feel I dry them better than anybody else in my family because I have many years of experience doing so, and I really hated drying silverware. Now, we had a family of four. Can you imagine my mom and dad, after dinner, retreated to the living room and my brother and I were left to do dishes. That's a terrible abuse of the <laughs> And let me tell you, my brother always got to, well, I wish I could have watched it, because that crew was quicker than the dry. My brother's four years old. And we didn't have a we didn't have a fancy sink. We had a sink. Just a sink. One well sink. And the silverware. That just take, it took so much. Because by the time I got to the silverware, Tim was already done and in the room watching the one and only TV we had that had three channels and one didn't come in room. My dad went outside and moved to antenna. Terrible, terrible child life. <laughs> now it gets better. If I didn't try that silverware completely, you know, so I, I thought I'd just throw them in there a little wet, you know. Or put a cup up there and just not dry. And the old man would come out and he would, they always inspected your work. Again, terrible use of child. And if there was one dish or one piece of silverware, because you had been warned that was not dry properly. Guess what you got to do? Dry every dish in the cupboard and every piece of silverware in the floor because he would make it wet again. Another one of my jobs was to dust. Here's a dust cloth. And it wouldn't have been so bad that my mother had more room dividers than we had room. You know what a room divider is, don't you? Those stands. What do you guys call them? I call them dust collectors. <laughs> and my mother had it, had all her pictures on there, her nicknames, <coughs> her doilies, and all this and that. And everything had to be placed right back to where you got it, where it came from. So you learned that if you're on the top shelf, you put everything on the floor right in order so you knew to put it back again. And then she also, another part, part of dusting was taking care of the plants. And we have more plants than you can. Get a water. And she had a plant here, a plant there, here a plant, there a plant. Everywhere a plant, plant, <laughs> there was a plant. And she would say while we were cleaning, she'd say, take that, take that faded leaf off of that plant there. I don't want it sucking the life out of it. I would think, suck the life out of it. <laughs> say, please die. Die. <laughs> Because long after I was done dusting, I had to go around and water these plants. And she kept a bag of dirt that you would buy. Uh, not a small bag. It was you know, looked like the, the, the lower 40 had been plowed, and that's where the top soil was. And it was that dirt you buy at the garden part of the store that had the white little things in it. I don't know what they call it. But if a plant was about to die, we weren't content just to say, well, let it go to life. <laughs> we had to get it out, and we had to help her. And she would repot it, she would rework it, until she could get that thing restored and brought back to life. But here in Song of Solomon 1 6, sometimes we become withered and dried up because of neglect, our own neglect. Solomon, Song of Solomon 1 6. The Shulamite woman says, Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. So there's so many reasons, so many things that can happen that can bring this witheredness into our heart and into our lives. What happens sometimes is, we become, we become so focused on the how we got to where we are that we can't look beyond that to see where he is going to take us and what restoration he's going to bring into our lives. This man had a withered hand. How did he get that? We don't know. If you're dry in spirit today, how did that happen? 
someone speak over you. In fact, really what it is, is did they, did they curse you? Remember the fig tree that Jesus cursed? Some people, a word has been spoken into their lives, and it has brought a curse upon them. And they can't get beyond that. They've been injured. They've been wounded. And instead of letting healing come into their lives, you know what happens? They keep picking at that scale. They keep picking at that wound. I, I am sad to report that in several places where I've ministered, I have met people, I'm not here, I, I'm not that I've ministered here, but I haven't heard, I heard any stories about here, but places I've been, I've met people out and about, and they said, oh, you pastor at church. Does Mrs. So-and-so still come to that church? Yes, she does. And they told me, I will never come to that church as long as she is there. Because this is what she said or did to me. Or what she said or did to my mother. Or to my brother or my sister. I try to get people to look beyond that. I will tell you this one place that we pastored. We had a Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, one Sunday morning, I was sitting in my office, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, my office was in the basement of our parsonage, and I felt the Lord say to me, go to church. I thought, is that the word of that? Go to church. Go over to church. And I felt prompted yet another time, there's something I want you to witness anybody over that I knew of. So I got up and I started to head across. I got, went through the parsonage yard and got into the parking lot. I was heading over and I was going to go around to the I was going to go in the basement which is right behind you know, the church basement, the back of the church face, the parsonage. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, no, go through the front door. That's a longer walk. I'm all about the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So I went through the front door. And as I opened the door, see the front door opened quietly. The basement door did not. And as I opened that front door, I knew instantly what the Lord wanted me to hear. One of the guys that was helping me there in the church was halfway up the steps leading down to the basement. I heard him saying, oh, now, now, let's not go there. Let's not be doing that. That's, that's, that's not right. And he looked at me and I went, and I heard her. This same woman that had turned so many people away was taking me to task. I have more nerve than I have brains. And I motioned him to come up the steps down to the basement and I sat right in her Sunday school class and I said to her, you should be ashamed. You should be ashamed. Injured a lot of people over the years. When she finally, when her and her husband finally, her husband had come to church, but he liked me. But uh, when they finally moved away and she had to go to another church, I'll be honest with you, maybe please don't fault me for this, but I wanted to, I wanted to run around all over uh, that community and tell people, hey, she's gone. She's gone. Sometimes we can get wounded in the house of God, but don't let that hold you back. I've been hurt, I've been hurt in the house of God, and I have hurt in the house of God. I've been withered. I've been stymied. I've been crippled. But to be honest, I have done the same. This man, we don't know. Was it his own neglect? We don't know. We just know there's a man with a withered hand. What's happening in our hearts and our spirits? Are we dry? I don't know. I don't know what's causing that. That's not important. And then there were the scribes, the scribes and the Pharisees, 
So we see the man with the withered hand, and we see the scribes and the Pharisees. They were those who wanted to keep him withered and dried up, who wanted to keep him from his blessing. They are those who cared more about their own agenda than his welfare. They had no compassion for him. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees cared about one thing and one thing only, and that was their own tradition and keeping that tradition and making people uh, to be so encumbered under their tradition that they couldn't be set free. That's why Jesus said, All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, what Jesus was saying is, you've been burdened under the cumbersome yoke of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but you come under my yoke, for it is easy and my burden is light. In Mark chapter, in Matthew chapter 23, I want to read that this morning. Matthew 23, verse 13. <clears throat> but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore shall you receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You see, there will always be someone that will try to keep you from your blessing, and that's what these guys wanted to do. They were watching. Is he going to heal on the Sabbath? You can't do good on the Sabbath. You can't do that. You can't heal. There will always be someone who will be negative, trying to speak negatively into your heart and into your life. Let me tell you something. You start to move in the Spirit. You start to cry out to God. You start to really let the Holy Ghost move through you, and I guarantee you there will be someone who will try to bottle that up and stop. You know how many times I've heard people say, well, listen, you can't let things get out of control. I would to God it would get out of control. I would to God that His Spirit would flow. And the only one conducting and, may, and, and bringing any type of policing of that would be the Holy Spirit Himself. I think you're going too far. Don't get too emotional. Now stop that crying. Wait, wait, don't, don't laugh. Don't laugh at the Spirit. I don't see any more. Yeah, it's in there, believe me. It's in there. Don't go too far. Well, wait a minute. You have to do this and you have to do that. Mark chapter 7. I'm ready to read a little bit more about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mark 7, verse 6. And then we'll just give you a few more comments. What has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but with their heart, but their heart is far from me. How be it? In vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus said that they made the law of God of none effect because of their tradition. I've seen things happen under the power of the Holy Spirit to people that would shock many a Pentecostal person. But yet it's biblical. <clears throat> There are many things that under the move of the Spirit of God that there will be people who will object to. Don't let them dry up your spirit just because their voices are loud. Just because they seem to be in authority. Just because they seem to be of reputation. Well, God can't move on him because he once was married to someone else. Tell that to Catherine Coleman. Huh? You know the story of Catherine Coleman? She had a previous marriage. Careful what you say here. But God can't move on 
her because she is a she. Tell that to Amy Simple McPherson. Tell that to, to Mother Brown, who the, one of the largest churches in New York City in the 20s 